Hello, everybody. Are you there? Well, we just had our opening session with John Cherry. We're talking about the groundwater project and uh, we had some questions. We had about 150 people participating on that from so many countries. The list goes on. We could count at least 30 different countries, which is amazing how people are engaged in our project and how you know broad this can be. This audience will reach many people and we need you to help us, to help us spread the news about the groundwater, to tell people that we have free books, to, help, to, to ask people to volunteer, to do translations, to help people to take a look. You know, when you take a look on one illustration of the book and you say, well, I can do better. No problem. You make a very nice illustrations and we will send to the authors. And the authors decide that if they might uh, add that to their book in the next edition. The editions are electronic, so they're, you know, the cost is low. We can have a new edition with your illustration. Why not? It doesn't need to be a sub for an, uh, an existing illustration. Sometimes you have something in mind, you devise the nice illustration of a part of the book that is missing and you consider it's missing. We can send to the others. Our aim here is to have participation from all of you. Hyperintelligence, activate. See that on our previous uh, session. It's open on YouTube. Share and like our, our videos and our posts. Participate. Your presence and your participation, it's so important to make the world a better place. And the well, Groundwater pro Project wants to be a tool to help you use your skills to make the world a better place. Thank you very much. We have here next the presence of the two important persons uh, talking about the book Groundwater from Freeze and Cherry. We have Freeze and Cherry uh, speaking about the book. It's going to be a fun session, uh, I assure you. The authors are very, very nice. And they're talking about how the book was produced and how it became what it is. The famous book or the most famous book in groundwater ever. And how it became the seed of the groundwater project. So I'm taking too much of your time now. Let's go for the juicy stuff. Let's go for the John and, and Alfred's presentation. Thank you very much and share and like your videos. You're welcome here, thank you. Hello everybody. Welcome to the first panel of our first groundwater project event, Making Groundwater Visible. I'm your host, Everton de Oliveira. I'm a hydrogeologist, as many of you are. Thank you so much for joining us. Please, upload your picture watching the event and tag it at, ground, at the groundwater, all together, at the groundwater, to be featured on our social media pages. We count on you. Like and share our posts. Volunteer to help translate books into your mother language. Make a difference. Let's make the groundwater visible. Today, we have the honor to bring you Dr. Alan Fries and Dr. John Cherry, to talk about the classic textbook, Groundwater, about their thoughts on the future of groundwater and much more. Before we start, I would like to thank our sponsors for making this event possible and free for all of you. TDS, Technical Development Solutions from Saudi Arabia. Hydroplan, a consulting company from Brazil. G360 from the University of Guelph in Canada. Solinst Equipments from Canada, and Waterloo Barrier also from Canada. Without them, this noble endeavor would not be possible. Please join them. Donate if you are an individual or add the name of your company to a game changer initiative, okay? Be a sponsor. We will have a presentation. Start with a presentation of Alfreeze, followed by John's. 
and then we'll have a talk show. It's going to be fun. Let's start. John and all, thank you for joining us. Please, a first word from both of you. Thank you. Hello, Everton. John here. It's my great pleasure to attend this event that you put lots of work in to get organized with your colleagues. And it's always wonderful to reach out to the world uh, to a global audience. So thank you, and it's my pleasure. I, oh. share I share John's thoughts, and I guess I'm going to be the first one up today. Yes, please. Go on. We're looking forward to it. Hello, everybody. Uh, Alan Fries here. Today's special event, as I understand it, is designed to introduce the groundwater project to the groundwater community around the world. But in one sense, it all started 43 years ago when John Cherry and I published our textbook, Groundwater. The Groundwater Project team thought you might be interested in how that came about and how one led to the other. So today you're gonna to get a couple of presentations, one from me about the genesis of the textbook, Groundwater, and one from John about the genesis and current status of the Groundwater Project. Now, just to introduce myself, you may be interested in the current life of a now long in the tooth textbook author. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada with my wife, Donna, 59 years married. I have been fully retired for 10 years. Lots of golf, lots of travel until COVID. I, I'm not uh, totally dead. I do uh, write popular science articles and topics and things that are of interest to me. The reason I bring this all up is because I'm only peripherally involved in the groundwater project. Uh, I haven't been a major participant. Uh, it's been John's the, the leader and uh, I just want to make that clear. And that's the reason that I'm going to talk about the past rather than the future and leave the future to John. There is a connection, however. So let me tell you how this all sort of came about. The Groundwater Project started with a desire to regain the rights to the, our textbook groundwater and make it available online and free of charge to all worldwide users. The initial push to do this was actually carried out by Kathy Ryan, a former PhD student of John Cherry's and now at the University of Calgary. She is heavily involved with an organization called Hydrogeologists Without Borders. And it was really under her push that we got the rights back from uh, our publisher, which wasn't an easy thing to do. They, they're making money out of these books. And uh, after 40 years on, in publishing, we decided that uh, we, we convinced them that there was not much more money to be made and they uh, got the rights back to us. The original idea, as I remember it, John, was that we would have it as a kind of a wiki platform. The, the book would be, be up there for everybody to use free, but eventually we would invite people to kind of uh, improve it. John was the one who recognized that we needed something much more than that. And we owe him a debt of gratitude for his vision and leadership. Uh, what has come about, the Groundwater Project, is much, much more than a wiki platform or a revision of Freeze and Cherry. But it did start there. And I do think there's a strong parallel between what drove us to write Groundwater in 1979 and what is driving John and his team to develop the Groundwater Project in 2021. John and I are both uh, Canadians. We were born and raised here. We, uh, we, we've made our career here. And things Canadian have had a strong impact on us both, I think. And I, I hope it doesn't sound too sort of jingoistic to be talking about all these Canadian things that I'm going to in the next couple of slides. Perhaps the, the first thing is both of us were students in an undergraduate geological engineering program. John at the University of Saskatchewan, myself at Queen's University in Ontario. And these geological engineering programs are fairly common in Canada, still exist in a lot of universities, including UBC where I worked, and uh, not so common in the United States or in other countries. And they turned out to be the perfect uh, background for a, a life in groundwater research. They, they included the geology. We were, they were often based in geology departments. So we learned about geological environments, the stratigraphy and structure and so on, and glacial geology and things like that. But we also took a lot of engineering courses in uh, soil mechanics, rock mechanics, hydraulics. And we also had a much stronger background in math, science, and you know, design and synthesis of engineering than did someone who comes through a straight geology school. So I think, uh, part of the way, the reason that a couple of under 40 year olds were able to write a textbook back in 1979 was this training that we had in the first place uh, from our undergraduate geological engineering. 
then we were also influenced by the fact that uh, Canada already was developing a lot of uh, expertise in groundwater. Uh, Joe Toth, whose picture is uh, on the top there, uh, was the first person to be awarded the Mainzer Award by the uh, Geological Society of America back in 1965. There have been 11 Canadians since have, have won that award. Joe has written an article that he called, he called this the Canadian Groundwater School. I don't know if that's uh, the right thing to call it or not, but uh, there was a lot of uh, good people around us. And a lot of these people became mentors to us. Uh, Peter Mayboom was a, a, a very important member, mentor to me. He was a few years older than me, but a young man with stirring enthusiasm for science and a charismatic leadership abilities. He espoused the watershed as a more appropriate measure or unit of study than the aquifer and uh, pushed us all toward consideration of basin-wide water balances and more meaningful methods of assessing long-term groundwater availability. Bob Farvolden, whose picture is the bottom one there, was originally the head of the groundwater group at the Alberta Research Council and subsequently became the founding uh, power, I guess, behind the groundwater school at the University of Waterloo years later. So it had a huge impact on Canadian groundwater. The other two names, Earl Christensen and Bill Manili, were uh, two fellows that worked for the Saskatchewan Research Council, and John and I both worked in Saskatchewan. And uh, they were the ones that sort of taught us the importance of understanding geological history. And if one wants to locate uh, aquifers and understand the groundwater of a particular area. So those guys had a big influence on our lives. So how did we ever get together? We first met in the summer of 1962 in Saskatchewan, province of Saskatchewan in the prairies of, of Canada. I'm gonna give, give you a little Canadian uh, politics here. Saskatchewan at that time was governed by a, a political party called the CCF, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. It was known as an agrarian socialist party. It has subsequently come to be known as the New Democratic Party, the NDP, which is still currently active in Canada, the third party in Canada. Uh, they've never been in federal power, but they have been in provincial power in many provinces over the years. And in fact, they are the government of British Columbia where I live right now. But anyway, the summer of 1962 is pretty famous because that's when the CCF brought in the first universal healthcare program in North America. And uh, it became the model for the Canadian healthcare uh, program that developed a few years later. We also learned that summer that both John and I were headed for Berkeley that fall uh, to become grad students in groundwater. Uh, it was independent, but there we are. We arrive in Berkeley a few months later and the free speech movement, the Berkeley riots, all of a sudden crash around us. Vietnam, civil rights, a year later, the death of John Kennedy. So it was during all this uh, very heady times, if you want, that John and I discovered that we had rather interesting family backgrounds and worldviews that were very similar to each other. Both his parents and my parents had been very active in, in the New Democratic Party and in what you might call, in, at least in a Canadian sense, left-wing politics. Not very left-wing, but a little bit. Now, I don't know whether that fact that we had these same backgrounds and life views affected how we wrote our book, but I think it might have, uh, that we, we, we saw things in a rather similar fashion. So John, uh, after uh, Berkeley, John actually was just there for a year, then went to the University of Illinois. After uh, getting his PhD, he took a postdoc in France because he recognized that he wanted to get a little more expertise in chemistry, uh, studied under Henri Scholaire, who was the lead guy in that sort of work in the world at that time, became the first Canadian professor to specialize in hydrogeology at the University of Manitoba, and then became a founding participant of the new University of Waterloo groundwater program. I got my PhD at Berkeley, and of course came under the tremendously positive influence of Paul Witherspoon, a big bear of a man with a vital life force who made, made life fun, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, my my co-student at the time was Shlomo Neumann, who I'm sure you've all heard of. I went on and did some work at IBM and ended up at the University of British Columbia. So I arrived at UBC in 1973, and uh, as the director of our geological engineering program, and was asked to start teaching groundwater courses, which of course I did. Now at that time, there were a couple of textbooks available. David Todd's textbook, Groundwater Hydrology, or Davis and DeWeest, Hydrogeology. 
I selected Todd's book, partly because uh, I don't know if you know, but Todd was from the University of California at Berkeley. And both John and I had taken his courses when we were there. And uh, you know that was, seemed a reasonable choice. Both these books and any others that were available at the time had a big emphasis on water supply, aquifer development, pump tests, things like that. Pretty much one topic. That's not what I found sitting in my classrooms when I was teaching groundwater at UBC. What I found was a very interdisciplinary underground undergrad group of students who are interested in the role of groundwater in a variety of different things other than just aquifers and water supply. I had geologists who were interested in the role of groundwater in the genesis of ore deposits, geological engineers interested in landslides, civil engineers, CB sewer earth dams, mining engineers interested in dewatering open pits, geographers interested in the role of groundwater in forming geomorphological landforms, foresters, soil scientists, environmentalists. Also in my own research and consulting practice, uh, I was finding that uh, the things I was dealing with were not always just the, the classic groundwater problems. I, I got involved in basin scale water budget calculations. I got involved in pore pressure studies at dam site abutments. Uh, some of you may know I got involved in the land subsidence at Venice, a tremendously interesting project. I got involved in the nuclear waste disposal nuclear waste disposal programs at both the US and Canada, pipelines and permafrost. And all of this in my case was connected through computer modeling because that was the area that I had worked on at Berkeley. So I began to wonder whether publishers might be interested in a groundwater textbook of a more interdisciplinary nature. However, I had a problem. The problem was I didn't know any chemistry. I knew chemistry was somehow important and I knew John had been to France and worked with Henri Chalair and I also knew that he was himself thinking about maybe uh, writing a book or get, getting his thoughts in, in, in order in that form. So I called him and I asked him if he might be willing to contribute a chapter on groundwater chemistry. That's where I thought it fitted in. Nine chapters on the stuff I knew about and one chapter on his stuff, you know. He politely refused and he proceeded to explain the future to me. I was unaware really at that point of the imminent explosion of groundwater contamination issues. They were just emerging then. And uh, the solution, as he proposed it and I accepted, was a 50-50 collaboration, where I would look after the chapters in the book that had to do with physics and flow and engineering applications. And he would look after the chapters in the book that had to do with chemistry and transport and contaminant applications. So was born a Groundwater 1979, the textbook. Uh, we never worked in the same place together, John and I. He was always in the East and I was in the West, 2,000 miles apart. Uh, we met at many uh, GSA and AGU meetings and sat in hotel rooms and talked things over and went over what we were doing and sent things back and forth. But there's a few things that were of interest. One was the title. We thought about, you know, foundations of groundwater and introduction to science of groundwater, blah, 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 all sort of stuff. Finally settled on one, one word title, groundwater. Problem was, it wasn't spelled as one word at that time. Both the USGS and the uh, National Groundwater Association spelled it as two words. So uh, we were 37 years, 38 years old, kind of arrogant. We just spelled it our own way and went with it. In fact, we did that quite a bit through the book because I think, again, there was an advantage to coming from another country than the United States. We weren't, we didn't feel sort of that we had to follow the step of exactly what they say the USGS was presenting in their papers and so on. We could sort of go our own way and we did. Then of course, there were the chapter logos. A fellow named Peter Russell from Waterloo made us those incredibly neat logos that are at the top of every chapter. And one of them was Dave, Joe Toth's groundwater flow system. Little did we know that we hadn't mentioned which was the top and which was the bottom of these logos. And out came Prentice Hall, our publisher, with a suggestion for the cover, which I've shown here, with an upside down flow system on it. Well, many, many phone calls back and forth between Waterloo and Vancouver. What are we gonna do about this? We tried flipping it over, making it technically correct. It didn't look so good anymore. It looked pretty good this way. It looks like a rainbow. I don't know, it looks as a... So we finally decided that at the very least, when the students got to chapter six, they would have an aha moment and realize that the front cover was upside down. And we decided to go with it. 
Whether that was the right decision or the wrong, I don't know. We've had a lot of opinions expressed to us over the years. But anyway, through the luck of good timing, uh, the book is successful. I just want to close off with thinking a little bit about uh, what was what the situation was in 1979 and how it differs and is and is the same in 2021. In 1979, when we wrote our book, I think you could take all the groundwater hydrologists in North America and put them in one room. We all dabbled in many facets of the subject. The science was still relatively immature. The knowledge was broad but shallow. We all worked in both field and theory, and it was not necessary to specialize in one or other to make a contribution or to specialize in any particular small topic. We all wrote papers on all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, flow nets and aquifers and pump tests and uh, geology and so on and so forth. So two guys not yet 40 could write a textbook, which I don't think maybe they could nowadays. What was the same is maybe the more important thing. At both periods of time, I believe there was an explosion of knowledge that needed to be taken into account. And in 1979, what we felt was that a groundwater textbook had to become much more inter interdisciplinary. It had to go from one main topic, water supply, to a book full of topics, each of them covered with a broad but shallow brush. 2021, and I think John was the one to realize that we had to go from a book full of topics to a multitude of topics, each requiring a book of their own and each covered in considerable detail. And so was born the Groundwater Project. And that's the end of what I have to say. And I think John will take it from there and talk a little bit more about the Groundwater Project itself and where it is and how it's coming along. And I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was quite interesting. Uh, I know the story, you know, from uh, here and here and there and talk to John. But uh, you had an interesting topic. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, in a moment on our uh, talk show. Please, John, now it's your, your time to, to present. Uh, before I proceed with this uh, slideshow uh, about the Groundwater Project, I could say uh, that um, Al did a really nice job of, of uh, explaining the history. It's always a pleasure to, to hear it. Um, we were amazed at how it all turned out. And after 10 years, People were saying, well, why don't you update the book? It's a good book, but if you update it, uh, that'll be even better. And we didn't do that. The publisher pushed us uh, to do that. Um, and I think we, we understood that as two people, we were able to write a good book in 1979, but 10 years later, there was such an explosion in knowledge uh, that it wouldn't have been possible for us to do a really good job. So in fact, the book, sat there for decades and other very good books came out. Uh, and then I'll explain then how we actually got to, uh, to the Groundwater Project. So I'll, I'll speak to the Groundwater uh, Project. When, when I began to realize that it wasn't just a matter of, of updating the Friesen Sherry book, that we would need uh, a few books. Uh, and I started to invite people. And, uh, and then as I got thinking about it, I realized there, there are so many problems so many topics uh, in groundwater science and engineering now that we would need, need many books and we'd need many, many experts uh, uh, to write these books. So we proceeded and, and defined the, the groundwater project. And the important uh, uh, premise is that knowledge should be free and the best knowledge should be free knowledge. And that's the basis upon which we uh, proceeded uh, the Groundwater Project is an act, act of hope in which many people can participate uh, towards a more sustainable uh, planet. And so the Groundwater Project had its beginning uh, in terms of serious work in 2017 uh, when the ideas were developed in concrete forms and I began to invite participants. And we registered that as a nonprofit corporation in Canada in 2019 and it's based and administered at the University of Guelph. And it's committed to advancement in education by creating and making available online, free, high quality groundwater education material for all. And to do this, then we're inviting experts from uh, dozens of countries around the world. And the philosophy is that uh, groundwater knowledge should be democratized. By this, we mean that there should be full and free accessibility 
of good quality knowledge and the ability to share this knowledge, thereby overcoming current impediments related to groundwater publications. And in many cases now, groundwater publications are published by companies that run journals and publish textbooks. And of course, they have to make a profit uh, to stay in business. And of course, that very much limits what can be published. And it limits the languages in which it, the printed material or the published material can appear in. So our vision and mission, um, the Groundwater Project will be the source that people throughout the world will rely on for groundwater education and how it relates to other waters and societal needs and issues. Okay, that's, that's the aim, the grand aim. And the mission then will provide accessible, engaging and high quality education materials free of charge online in many languages to all who want to learn about groundwater and how, how groundwater relates to and sustains ecological systems and humanity. In the Freeze and Cherry book, we, we stuck to groundwater science and engineering. In the Groundwater Project, we want to cover all, all of the aspects of groundwater that are relative, relevant to humanity and ecology. The Groundwater Project manages with staff support um, of various key activities. Right now, there are three uh, people who assist, uh, assist the activities conducted by hundreds of volunteers uh, internationally from various diverse uh, groups. So the Groundwater Project is a volunteer-based and a collaborative organization. And currently we have over 300 volunteers who are participating in the Groundwater Project. And this includes authors, reviewers, and editors. So it's a monumental task and could only be done uh, with this uh, volunteer framework. So our goal is to reach as many people as possible by publishing books uh, for everyone. The Groundwater Project is aimed at raising groundwater consciousness and, and to strengthen groundwater expertise worldwide. And this is a very complicated slide and we won't stare at it uh, very long, but at the top, uh, we have the type of, of levels of information that we're looking for. We want to introduce groundwater uh, to uh, to the general uh, public. Uh, we want to have books published for children and then hundreds of uh, books um, written for people who want to uh, work in groundwater and solve groundwater problems. Uh, we want to have uh, books on the various uh, components of groundwater uh, and between the disciplines. Uh, and the, pro the platform is online, uh, so it's available to all uh, to download uh, and just to pick up bits and pieces uh, in an ebook context. So, in our long term uh, plan, we're going to continue developing and publishing many more books, uh, releasing them as PDFs and as e publications. We want to collaborate with universities to develop course material. We want to have partnerships with organizations uh, around the world to advance our mission, and we're doing that. And of course, we want to have videos to help people learn and understand and to make groundwater interesting. And we're now hoping to move into the area of learning uh, online self uh, modules. And all of this is, is aimed at, at the at school children, at the general public, and at professionals. And we've been uh, going for three years, I just began publishing in the last uh, half year. And we published 10 books on our website uh, with many more to come in the new year and years following that. Some of these books are say 50 pages long and some of them are 150 pages. Uh, these books and many of them are more in the form of a chapter as part of a greater topic. And uh, we refer to them as books because they're standalone in many cases and they're authored by a team and they have separate ISBM numbers, et cetera. So they're meant to be complete packages uh, in their own right. And we have 200 or more books uh, scheduled for publication in the next few years. And that means we have confirmed authors working away uh, on more than 200 books along the lines of the, of the 10 books that we've already published. So we've recruited hundreds of authors who are now preparing more than 10, 200 books, as I mentioned. And uh, the, the, the big accomplishment now is that we have enough credibility to seek more and more credible authors to extend coverage to near all groundwater topics. And we want to interface with ecology and issues of governance. Um, we've learned how, thanks to Everton, uh, to crowdsource translations into several languages so that the Groundwater Project books will have a global reach. 
Uh, getting the translations done, of course, is a really important step uh, to making this project truly accessible and truly global. And this kind of summarizes the groundwater project we have on the left, the sort of the creation and use. We're engaging researchers, scientists, and practitioners, and they're kind of the creators, creators of the initial stuff. Uh, they're, they're synthesizing knowledge. Uh, and all of this is being done for users. And the users would be course instructors, practitioners, students, policymakers, uh, people in industry and, uh, and translators. But none of that will serve much of a purpose unless we're able to disseminate, to distribute. And what we're learning in this day and age is that you can't just go putting stuff up on the web and hoping people will look at it. You have to reach out through the internet with social media outreach and uh, uh, translators and everyone is involved to try and make it known that these materials are there available uh, and uh, and to encourage more participation in the groundwater project and our our aim is to have more than a million downloads by un world water day in march 22nd 2022 uh, and we're growing well uh, in in that direction and of course we'll need hope from all of you listening uh, to these presentations and everybody else around the world who get involved in the project. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, John, thank you all for your nice presentation. Let's talk about, about your story. People are quite interested, I'm pretty sure, and learn some of the details on how it happened, how uh, if this could be mimicked by someone else and, and what the future, you know, uh, awaits for all of us. So in Malaga, Spain, I was with John there and, and we met two Turkish young hydrogeologists. The one came closer to us, she said, John, you're Michael Jackson of hydrogeology. And that was so good. I just loved it. It was very, it was very fun. John was of course surprised about that expression. So your book, Freezing Cherry, is still singing and dancing on the hands of many students. It, the book is really a Michael Jackson of hydrogeology as you are, right? Uh, did you have a faint idea of this reach when you first released the book back in 1979? Al, would you think, like to start? I think our greatest worry was that it would be remaindered within a month. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be able to buy it for a nickel at a used bookstore somewhere. <laughs> we, we really didn't have an idea of all that. Uh, I know the, the first time I realized it was going to be a success is shortly after publication. I think both of us received a letter from John. I've kind of forgotten who it was now at the U.S. Geological Survey, who told us that, the, that he had arranged to buy like 100 copies of it and have one delivered to every USGS office in the United States. And that's when I realized that maybe we had somehow hit the button on the head somehow. You know, that was it. I remember being very anxious because the book was so different. Uh, and we had chapters on chemistry and, and contamination. And, uh, and many of those topics were still very new. And although I thought I knew what I was talking about, um, I was kind of anxious that people would point out, uh, you know, serious errors. Now we, we had great cooperation from excellent uh, colleagues, you know, across the US and Canada who reviewed material. So it was highly reviewed in, in, in that sense, but uh, uh, it was with great relief that I found out that people weren't pointing out that I got certain equations wrong. Uh, and, and there was parts of the, the, the geochemistry stuff that were based on thermodynamics. Uh, and thermodynamics is one of those topics for many of us who aren't thermodynamicists, where you always wonder, do you really understand it? <laughs> anyway, people think I do, and I actually don't, but uh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I can say that at UBC, at the time that John was writing his chapters, as they were coming hot off the presses, I was running a graduate groundwater course with, with my three or four graduate students, we were taking the exercises that he was putting at the end of his chapters and doing them. And I was learning because I knew nothing about all that sort of thing at that point. And uh, we would get back to him if we didn't, couldn't get the right answers or... Uh... So here was the, the writer of the... Uh, my biggest fear, I think, was that somebody was going to call me and ask me questions about the thermodynamics part. And I was going to have to admit that I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> so I... Uh, you, 
you may people may wonder why it's freeze and cherry, not cherry and freeze, given the alphabetical order. Uh, and, and there are a number of reasons. One is Al agreed to take on all the kind of difficult, hard completion stuff, like doing the uh, the index, uh, and like actually finishing the book. Um, and so we had all those problems there at the end of the chapters, but we put those in at the end and we didn't actually have provide an answer set. Um, and that was pointed out and then Al did all his answers for his questions and he would send them out to people across the world. And, and I let that lag and I let it lag so long that when I looked at some of those questions, I figured, oh my land, like those are difficult. <laughs> uh, so difficult that I couldn't get back to some of them. And, and, and years later, both my children, my daughter took um, chemical engineering at, at uh, McGill and then hydrogeology at Ottawa. And my son took geological engineering at Toronto. And they both, believe it or not, ended up taking a hydrogeology course with the Friesian Cherry book. And they would say, dad, it's about some of those hard problems. You know, do you have the answers? And I had to say, no, I really don't. Um, you're, you're on your own. I'm busy. And besides, some of them are very, very hard. Um, it's, it's much easier to make up a problem than it is to solve it. In fact, some of them, one of the problems was so sort of esoteric, and I didn't realize it, that our very good colleague, Dave McWhorter, uh, 30 years later or so uh, at a consulting meeting I was at, actually pulled out of his briefcase the answer to one of the questions. <laughs> and it was many lines long with lots of mathematics. And I looked at it and said, Dave, I'm not sure that that's what I had in mind, but he took the question uh, to be fundamental and, uh, and, and got an answer. So if any of you have struggled with the questions in the chemical part of the Freeze and Cherry book, well, if you've struggled, lots of us have, and I struggled too. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about modeling? You know, that was new as well, groundwater modeling at that time, right? Well, it was really just, uh, it was the beginning of it all. I mean, w when I went to Berkeley and studied under Paul Witherspoon, Paul was a, Paul, by the way, was not a, a computer modeler or a mathematician himself, but he recognized that that was the coming thing. And he had us all go off and take the necessary math. I had to take a math minor and learn all about that sort of thing. So that really was the very beginning. We were still using uh, cards, you know, punch cards and, uh, we, we did all our own programming, all Fortran programming, line by line by line for all those uh, papers that we wrote in those early days. So that's 62. By 79, that's 15 years later, whatever, uh, you know, things had come along and the USGS had started to work on mod flow and so on. So, uh, but I do think we were the first book to actually get at that at all or to realize the potential for it all and get something in there about it. Yeah, I, I thought that was very brave because it took many new fields in a single book at that time. That was, you're young and brave. That's what, that's the, the answer, isn't it? Young and foolish, maybe. <laughs> well, so no. I was thinking, as Al was giving his presentation, I was thinking, you know, there's a statement, it's not what you know in this world, it's who you know. <laughs> uh, and Al, had the, the, Al and I had the great fortune uh, to uh, meet uh, and uh, do this joint venture. And then as Al mentioned, our mentors were phenomenal. They were the, they were the originators of kind of modern groundwater science in a way. So who you know turned out in our career uh, to be so important. Well, uh, there, there's one point that I, that I always think is it's interesting. People ask, you know, uh, tell us about the, the making of the book. How was it? You know, the, the relationship between the two of you. Was one of you bossing around the other too much? Oh, How yeah. Did... I bossed him around all the time, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. As, as, a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it, it was so, um, it was so uh, productive and comfortable. As Al mentioned, we had very similar worldviews. Uh, also, he liked hockey and skiing and all that. So, you know, as as two Canadian men, we had lots to lots in, in common. Um, and, and I knew enough about the physical hydrogeology side so that I could, you know, comment on Al's side. He was the expert. Uh, and then he dove into all my geochemical stuff and actually would, would read it carefully, ask me questions. Um, and I think that had a, a great uh, help. Um, so if I could get Hi, it so that Al felt Hello, ever I done. could explain it, uh, then, then maybe we're headed to... Sorry, watching the YouTube interview? No. 
Yeah, I don't recall. Sorry. Oh, I, was say, I don't actually recall us ever having a serious disagreement, John, or you know, where we uh, start shouting at each other. I think we might have uh, tried to decide. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, how did I, I get that? Or this sort of thing, but by and large, it, well, said, it was very comfortable, and we we never lived in the same place. We we weren't able to contact each other on a daily basis. Uh, that's of course all predates all this uh, zooming and uh, so on. We did it uh, largely by mail, sending stuff back and forth, and. And then we made a point of going to every AGU meeting and every GSA meeting there was. And we would spend a lot of the time there not listening to the talks, but up in the hotel room going over the latest uh, chapter. And I don't know if I'll type, but I, I didn't type. So I would hand write and I would get a typist to type it. Uh, and with those, you know, those mimeograph sheets and whatnot as copies and we use mail. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. So like when, when, then you have to write very, very carefully. You're not just going on to a word processor. And, uh, and, and that may, in fact, have been helpful because it, it caused such care in your, in your writing. I don't know if John feels the same as I do. I love writing. I, 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 writing a textbook was a kind of a perfect uh, thing for me because when I, when I was doing research projects, the parts that I liked the best were the beginning and the end. Uh, a lot of researchers are the other way around. They like doing the work, they hate writing it up. But I love doing the research ahead of time and finding out what everybody else had done. Uh, my papers are always full of tables of what other people have done and where I think mine fits in. And on the other end, I loved writing it up. I enjoyed trying to be a, a good writer. And uh, so I think it certainly suited my personality. And I think it must have done the same for John. I, I reviewed it with a book, the translation of the book, so, and I, I reviewed it all. And so I read, not only studied, but I read it carefully. And uh, how did you work the, the, the text among each other? Because it, it, it is very fluid and, and it, it's not like very, like striking difference between uh, a chapter that was written by one or the other. It, they're, they're very smooth. How, how did you manage that? Just happen? Well, I think we, we reviewed each other's chapters very carefully, as I recall, John. I mean, I can recall, and we, and we did, agreed with each other that we weren't going to be insulted when when I wrote what I thought was the most beautiful piece of prose in history, and John stroked it all out and put in something better, you know, uh, vice versa. Oh, good. Yeah, that was my recollection. And, and we both, I think, had some strength in synthesis. We like taking a topic and, and making it clear. And as Al mentioned in his discussion, uh, of the history back in that era, uh, we would jump from topic to topic, and so very we were very much into lo looking at a topic and then cutting through the essence and trying to write it up. You could do that back then, so we'd done that. Uh, we you know we moved from topic to topic, and in that sense, we had a I think a very common view of of uh, of what we wanted to do. Good. How long did it take the whole thing? Because you were sending material by mail, by physical mail, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, not I can't sure. I'm not sure when we first broached the idea, John. Do you know? It's like maybe 76, maybe three years earlier or two years earlier? Or? No, I think it was 76. I took a whole year sabbatical at, at Berkeley, uh, half the year at Berkeley and half at Stanford in 70, 76. So I think we broached it in 75. Um, and I, I basically spent the whole year taking courses and reading and writing because a number of the topics uh, I hadn't written about uh, before. I remember when I was trying to teach myself some of the geochemical stuff, I remember going to use bookstores in the Berkeley campus and I got 10 introductory textbooks of introductory chemistry to try and convince myself uh, that I could understand a certain aspect of the topic. So for me, I had the great luxury of, of taking a whole year off uh, basically to learn and write and live in California with my children then when it was young and, and we enjoyed that. Uh, that was back when life wasn't too hectic. No e email, not even fax machines. Can you imagine? People couldn't bug you. Oh, and long distance was expensive. You would actually- Oh, could, I know. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, yes. <laughs> Terrible. So there's one thing about the, the book, like a, a, a French author once said that uh, you know, that books take a life of their own after publication. And you have a, a, a quite a long experience seeing the, your book flying around with people, right? Could you say something about oh. the life of its own, 
of the Prison Cherry book? What have you seen people saying something that you didn't expect? Well, first of all, the publisher kept publishing it. Are you sure? I mean, not, uh, like not many. And I think they had 25 or 35 uh, actual printings. Bro, uh, that's when we started talking. Uh, uh, can you mute on yourself there now? And there were professors across oh, the world who were kind of fundamental in the way, and they kept on using the book. You, you had to click. Uh, that was quite, quite amazing. Uh, and can in you my travels, it, 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 it can be quite embarrassing for, as I now you're fine out. World. In that era, Even to this day, people uh, ask me to sign up. Because that when we started yes, talking earlier, the, 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 the sound leak, the sound leak into the to the presentation. So the presentation is still going on here. That was quite interesting. Now I'm not sure if you knew, if you knew that we we had a like a session was a an event. John came here. And he came here for us to, to, to plan the, the groundwater project. So we took the chance to put a, a, an event to gather people because we had the, the translation of the, uh, into Portuguese of the book. And so after the, the, the end of the event, well, since people didn't have the originals because they were sold out for so long, right? We took, uh, we took a, an opportunity to get pictures because everybody can take a, a picture with their cell phones today. So after the event, we had John Cherry with a, you know, with a banner on his back with the groundwater <laughs> information, the book there, right? And people came to, to, to take a picture, like a uh, sign in the book, but the book didn't exist. And it was a long line, long line of people wanting to take a picture. And the people were taking pictures, well, for our experience, that was quite interesting because people were taking pictures and long before the line was over, we could see the pictures on the internet already because people were posting their pictures with the author. That was a very interesting experience, wasn't it, John? Yeah, so so Al was quite famous, uh, you know, internationally and he won awards, uh, you know, before the book was published. Um, and I hadn't had any of that type of exposure. I was busy working away to try and become a contaminant hydrogeologist. So when the book was published, it kind of catapulted us to the world stage, but particularly me. Um, Al, as I mentioned, already had this reputation. So after that, people actually began to kind of read my papers and, and whatnot. So I, I was really lucky uh, with the credibility that the book uh, gave me, you know, credibility way beyond uh, what any knowledge I would I would claim, um, and and uh, in a way that's almost you know it reminds me of how dangerous it is. One, you know, one one moment you're kind of a struggling professor, at, hoping that you know what you're talking about, and then a few years later you're this world famous people, and people think you understand all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> talking just talking about the life of the book and what kept it alive for so long. You know, a book like that gets referenced a lot. People write an article and they say something and they quote Fries and Cherry. I think about 60% of the quotes that came from Fries and Cherry were quoting one diagram. I think it's figure 2-1. It's the one that shows all the permeabilities of all the different rock and soil types. That's yeah. the one that you, you're forever re... I mean, I must admit, I'm, I, I must be still a little bit... Uh, I go through groundwater. I look at the at the papers that are in there. I don't read the papers. I just look to see if we got referenced in the back, you know. And Fries and Cherry's referenced. But you 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 are you know, forty years later, it's still referenced. But ninety percent of the time, it's referencing that one diagram. No, so I, I have to tell. So I, I have to I, tell I, I'm, I'm a witness to that all because I, I had a friend who had a you know a, a small a small copy of that in his wallet. You were yeah. <laughs> so I have to I have to tell you how that diagram came about because people would say to us that must have been a tremendous amount of work to go through all the groundwater literature and find out exactly what the the highest and lowest. For those that don't remember, that diagram shows for each rock type, let's say sandstone, that the it shows us a, a line that might go from ten to the minus two to ten to the minus six uh, centimeters a second or something like that, and. Uh, People say you must have taken a lot of time to go all through the literature and figure out those those lines and where they fit. The truth of the matter is, I recall sitting in a hotel room, John, somewhere, San Francisco or somewhere at AGU, and drawing that diagram and, and, he, and John saying, what do you think, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4? And I'd say, 
I don't know. I think I heard of a place where there might have been 10 to the minus three. Okay, let's make it 10 to the minus three. How about the other <laughs> hand? And that's how we drew that diagram. <laughs> now that brings up an important point. Yeah, I think it's the most highly cited uh, um, document in the English language, and it still is. And But it's a teaching book. It wasn't meant to be cited for, for, for information. So it took a, a life of its own as, uh, to be authoritative. So in, in a way, I tell students, absolutely, you cannot quote this book. It's a teaching <laughs> book. Cite something, you actually get Too it from the, from the basic uh, place. But as I mentioned, we did create that, that, that uh, table, which was original work. Yeah. It's going and I think it was more or less right. I mean, it wasn't horribly wrong or anything, but uh, no, yeah. but it just it was just based on sort of uh, by gosh and by golly, it wasn't very he heavily scientific. <laughs> so books are windows to new experiences. Textbooks have the ability to to bring synthesized knowledge to many people. From your experience of hearing comments, could you say something about uh, on how you believe? that Fries and Cherry influenced the lives of those who have read it? Well, I, 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 you know, I, I'll make a little comment. I've, I've my life, several... I, can, I, can, I can say something about my life. It did help me. <laughs> so I've, I've talked to several people who have told me that they, when, they, when it first came out and they'd already had a degree, uh, that they read the whole thing. Uh, and then they decided to basically go on and get a PhD in groundwater. Um, you know, I can't imagine sitting down and reading a whole book. Um, but anyway, that's that people have reported that to me. And when I go back to it these days, every once in a while, I want to look something up and see what we said. I'll go into it and and uh, and find that that uh, it's it's readable. And I've been thanked in my travels by people saying, you know, it it was it was readable. Uh, it's particularly readable once I think you actually know quite a bit. It pulls stuff together. I don't know if any, how many of you have read King Hubbard's original Theory of Groundwater Flow 1940 paper, but it is beautifully written. And I must admit, it had a bit, that paper had a big influence on my life, brought to my attention by Peter Mayboom, my mentor in Canada. And I read that thing, I thought that reads like a, like a novel kind of, you know, it's so beautifully written. And I, I do want to try and emulate that as best I can when, I, when I'm doing, get to the same stage. So uh, I think there was an attempt to try and write clearly and smoothly, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've done it. it. It is very smooth, for sure. The comment on King Hubbard's famous 1940 paper, that paper was, was buried. Uh, it's very mathematical. Uh, and it, it, I think it was Peter Mayboom and Joe Toth that resurrected it and Bob Travolden and brought it back and then it, it's the basis for groundwater flow system theory. So it's interesting again, tracing where our ideas come from. King Hubbard did that amazing work. It kind of got lost and Mayboom came along and resurrected it. And then it got into our hands as kind of the Bible of, of, of that type of, uh, of, uh, of groundwater science. Well, I think it resurrected physics. Again, we talked about physics and chemistry and our engineering backgrounds being stronger in those areas than perhaps someone, a lot of people in the groundwater field. And uh, the whole the whole thought when I read that article by that paper by King Hubbard, where he says, "Well, water, you know, people up and down say, well, water goes from the highest pressure to the lowest pressure," and you know, King Hubbard says, "No, no, no, it doesn't. It's energy per unit mass, and you know, there's a physics to it. It's physics," and uh, that I think res resonated with me a lot. Al and I uh, both I met Al and I both met M. King Hubbard then in his later years and enjoyed the chance to actually talk to probably the most brilliant groundwater scientists that the world has ever seen. So you get, you, you get along pretty well. Does the, the distance help, helps that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know. yeah. you're, you're in Vancouver, that's so far. <laughs> well, we used to joke about, you know, people thought we were, we were wedded at the hip kind of thing. So I would get phone calls at 4.30 in the morning, you know, saying, is, you know, not realizing that I don't live in Waterloo with the same city as John and don't teach at the same <laughs> university. And in fact, other than that one year at Berkeley, our first year of graduate studies, we never were in the same place at the same time again. You know, we just uh, but kept in touch over the years. And, yeah, and in yeah. fact, we didn't really, other than textbook, I, I, I'm having to think whether we ever wrote any papers together or anything. No, you know, no, I, no, I don't no, think, no, I don't no, think no, so. No, no, no. 
I don't think. I don't think so. I was just saying, John, I don't think you and I ever wrote a papers, any papers together other than the textbook. Is that correct? Or did we ever, uh, other no. than things that were kind of related to the textbook? And we wrote some political, almost political uh, comments at one point about the uh, Superfund and things like that. Yeah, we wrote that editorial in Groundwater, which got a lot of play in 1989. Yeah. I think that's the only one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so one question for you. How did your lives change uh, if... They did after the book success. Did you get rich with the <laughs> book sales? <laughs> Short answer, well, it, no. But uh, <laughs> on the other hand, it did provide, uh, you know, we call it uh, vacation money or something, you know. <laughs> you don't, when you write a book, you just hope you survive and people use it. And then much to our amazement, checks began to arrive. And they, they in, the, in, the, in the heyday, they weren't trivial. So I, I think, um, you know, some wonderful family vacations. <laughs> yeah. and, and indirectly, I mean, I'm sure both of us owe a lot of our subsequent career success and especially in things like in the consulting world. In my case, especially, I left academia in kind of mid-career after having been there 20 years and decided I'd go out and consult full time. Uh, I think having written the textbook certainly helped, uh, you know, me get, people searched me out and so on to get involved in these projects. And a lot of those, now that's where John and I did do a lot of work together. We, we sat on many, many uh, panels and things that were trying to help uh, clients uh, solve their groundwater contamination problems or other problems. And that's how Al and I actually could keep uh, up to date on what we were doing in our lives because we had these meetings we'd go to, we'd fly in and we'd have a great time having a beer talking about the state of affairs, et cetera. Yeah. So how do you see the groundwater situation? Al mentioned something in his presentation, the groundwater situation uh, in the world today as compared uh, when you uh, published the, the book. I mean, we have a lot more understanding, scientifically understanding, but what about uh, the politics of groundwater? Is it, you know, too different from that time or is it still the same? People don't see it. What do you think? I think it's uh, much more in the public eye now. I think when we were working back then, we were very much a tiny little nook and cranny in the back of the kind of geological earth science world. Nobody knew much about it. For instance, when I joined the Geological Survey of Canada with my first job, which was in between my bachelor's degree and going back to Berkeley, uh, the groundwater division was very much a second class citizen in that in that organization. They weren't. We weren't thought of as leaders or pathfinders or anything we were just kind of cranking our own little stuff away uh, and in the world certainly I don't think there was much realization that groundwater certainly groundwater contamination or supply or all those things were going to burst onto the field onto the world as problems now I think you know you pick up your newspaper and there'll be a groundwater article every once in a while about uh, you know the Ogallala aquifer or the Love Canal or the you know and so on yeah, I mean, the, the importance of groundwater with climate change and with a world population. I mean, when we published that book, the pop world population was probably 4 billion, uh, and now it's nearly 8. Uh, and so there's groundwater crises kind of all over the place. Uh, and what I'm, I'm enjoying is as I invite authors to, to write books for the Groundwater Project, I'm broadening out. I became very narrow. I became a very narrow uh, niche uh, contaminant hydrogeologist and the amount of science that's been done and the amount of topics worked on is mind-boggling. I mean I thought the 20 chapters or you know books were going to cover everything we'd ever want to know once we got into the idea of doing electronic books and now it's going to be hundreds because there's so many different versions, so many different contaminants, so many different hydrogeological regimes, so many different health effects. It's, it's mind-boggling. But keep, keeping in mind that groundwater is 99% of the liquid fresh water on the globe. So it's no wonder that groundwater finally is coming into its own as being, being important. And, you know, and most of the water flowing most of the year in rivers and lakes and whatnot is, is groundwater. So the, the topic is so uh, immense. And we had the great good fortune of publishing a book just at a time when it was beginning to be recognized. So as Al mentioned, we were actually able to do it as opposed to now 
where it, it's hard for me as a contaminant hydrogeologist even to speak knowledgeably in a very narrow niche area uh, of groundwater contamination. Quite a new world. Yep, sure. Oh, so I, I, I agree with you, lots, lots of new stuff. We have, have a long way to go with the groundwater project. We know that the groundwater is, uh, needs visibility, right? For the large, large public, you know, public at large, because we're talking about hydrogeology to hydrogeologists, and we want to go, um, we want to send the information to the wider public. So how do you, do, do you think we can manage to reach that by using the groundwater project? Do you have anything in mind or just waiting to happen? Well, for the groundwater project, I mean, we're hoping, I mean, we've already published one uh, children's book done 30 some years ago, but we would hope to have many more. So we're seeking authors from all over the world. Uh, we want to publish uh, books that are written at the, shall we say, the general lay public level, suitable for high school education. And then we've got uh, one book already published and more in progress that are at the scientific American level you know, published for, you know, people who already have an interest and some education in science, but very readable. And those, so children's books, uh, books for, uh, the, you know, the general public uh, and scientific American level books will be key uh, to bringing awareness and bringing appreciation. We groundwater people, you know, we, we live in our little niche and there are not many of us when you actually look at the size of the problems and groundwater suffers from not, of not having awareness. You know, it's not taught in the high schools. Most of the water managers in many government agencies don't know anything about groundwater. So to be successful, we've got to get people who are willing to write for all those other levels. That's really important now. And difficult, of course, finding people who can write science and engineering and whatnot so it can be understood by a wider audience. So those are sort of the ultimate challenges. Yeah, my own view is that the science and engineering is probably understood at a sufficient level to attack most of the problems in the world. I mean, there are things that need to be done, smaller, you know, improvements, but the real problems lie in the legal and economic and resource-based and all that sort of thing. I think it's, that's the groups that we have to somehow make a, a, an attempt to impact. However, I also want to I sit around an awful lot of rooms with like-minded people who say, nobody understands this. We don't seem to get enough attention, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, next to uh, world terrorism and poverty and uh, a variety of other topics, I mean, we got to realize our place in the world. We can, we can help with, uh, contribute to the solution of those problems in a small way. And, you know, that's, we're not ever going to be uh, top of the heap uh, scientists field of the world or anything, that's proper. So I, I think that one of the big challenges of the Groundwater Project will be to write books that are uh, between the disciplines. So in academia, you, you, you crawl into your little discipline or sub-discipline and you stay there and then you talk to your colleagues and you publish in your journals. So one of our emphasis areas will be to write material that can be understood uh, at the interfaces. We're hoping that the groundwater governance people can write things that we, you know, scientific and engineering people would appreciate and vice versa. So it's the science progresses then to become reductive, you know, becomes narrower and narrower. And that's one of our inflictions in, in a modern science that we would hope the groundwater project will, will try and work hard to overcome as best we can. Okay, guys. So I, I think, well, we, we have lots to talk here. And it would be fun to keep talking. You have so many interesting stories. And I hope all share his stories with us uh, every now and then. We can bring them to people. I'm, I'm confident you have very interesting other stories to fill our gaps here in groundwater and how you manage to solve problems. So please, could you, could you make your final statements for us, please? Tell something to the people something like encouraging people to, to join us or something like that, please. I'll let you go first, Al. <laughs> As being someone who, who didn't really join the groundwater project in, the, in all the full status, maybe I could have. 
uh, that was a personal decision. I wanted to get on the golf course and uh, do some other kinds of writing uh, on other topics entirely. So maybe I'm the wrong person to do that. But, uh, you know, it's, I think we've said our say. It's, uh, it's an important topic. It's, uh, there's lots still to do. We, uh, especially, as John says, we have to learn how to uh, interact with people from completely different backgrounds, lawyers and economists. And, and when, I must admit, uh, for me, having left academia in mid-career and got into the consulting world, that was, a, that was an education in itself. I, I sat around many rooms, uh, as John did too, with lawyers in the background. And uh, I, you know, I sat around courtrooms and listened to uh, cases being tried and so on. And I realized the great differences there are between uh, sort of academia, science, and the real world, if you want. And, uh, you know, we have to bring groundwater into that real world. Uh, and I think the groundwater project is, uh, looks like it's going to be an important contribution to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I tend to answer your question. I, I, as I read the, the books that are being written when I see drafts and when I talk to the authors of the, many of the books being made, um, I, I think that uh, it's all very exciting um, the way when you get authors writing to their topics that they've spent their life studying and trying to get it so we can all understand it. So groundwater science is very diverse. It's got a, you know, many different problems. And I think for the first time to the groundwater project, we're all going to be able to read about it, you know, in a way that we can follow and appreciate. And uh, in, in that sense, it's a global collaborative project that, uh, uh, that uh, hopefully will will uh, bring uh, young people into the field and will show the excitement and value of uh, of science. Well, thank you, thank you both of you. Uh, I'm pretty sure you you are an example for hydrogeologists because you're not only one of our objectives of having this uh, conversation is to show everybody that most people read your books, but they didn't, haven't seen you together no, uh, and they don't know you in, in person. So they will see the, the videos. And they see they're like your your uh, fun, pe fun people to be with, not only the, the you know, a distant author, you know, someone who, who wrote a book and it's a distance working in a, in a closed room or things like that. And that they can they can do their share. That's That's the idea. How? They can translate our books. They can go there and make a, a, an impact on his own world. I mean, when we read, and I'm, I'm talking about my, my experience. I read your book in English, of course. That was the only uh, available version that we had. And my English was poor, right? And a second language is never your first language. It's never your mother language. It's OK. We, can, we, we talk and we, we understand everything. But you're ever more comfortable in your mother language. So to spread the the word and to to spread the knowledge of groundwater and make it real, you know, a worldwide knowledge. I think that if you that is watching us here today, make your part, do a translation for our books. That's going to be very important, and you can see the results. They they, they might not get rich, as they said, right? from publishing a book, but they did good for a lot of lives. So thank you both for helping my life to become better by studying on your book. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. We're back in shape here, all right? Uh, all right, now we're live now. Thank you very much. So we have all and John here open to questions. Okay. And I'll... We're back in shape here. Just a right. second. Uh, Put the sun off here. <laughs> so we have some questions for you guys. Your presentation was very nice. Lots of people from all over the world. And we have some questions. I would like to start with some points here. 
Todd Rasmussen from University of Georgia, Athens, says, as a young grad student in, uh, in, uh, in Arizona in 1979, when Alfreys was visiting and writing his book, his talks and writing captured my imagination. It opened the door to a field I knew nothing about. Thank you. So, Al, you want to say something? Well, thank you, Todd. You're welcome. <laughs> it was a good time in Arizona back then. I remember it well. <laughs> very good. Very good. So, we have another one. It's uh, Victor. Oh, Jesus. He's from, from Hungary. So, I have a hard time reading his name. Victor Gerald Nzewuji. Something like that. Sorry, guys. Uh, he just mentioned about, uh, you were talking about Joseph Toth, and he's Hungarian-Canadian, you know, for the famed uh, regional groundwater system. He's, he's thanking you for reminding of that. Uh, so, we have one question here, let me see. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Heiskirk from University of East Anglia, Norwich, England. When you wrote the book, who did you perceive the audience to be and who you might convey groundwater topics to? Well, I guess I can start on that. I, I don't think there's any question that when we first wrote the book, our, our audience that we had in mind was students. But as we were writing it, we began to realize that perhaps we were presenting material that might be of use to you know, consultants or people who are out working in the field as well. And maybe we try to uh, cover that base as well. I don't know if John has something to add to that or not. Not. I think John. John's frozen. Okay, I no, I, I agree. I, I I found it wasn't all that uh, could have helped. Nope. No. Yeah, I found it wasn't. Can you hear me now? Oh. Ah, yeah. My my internet is unstable. Really, start again. See, it's working now. Yeah, the, the book then was a, a dual fold book. It was meant for undergraduates, but also for uh, for people who, who might want to read about groundwater in a broader perspective. So it was the compromise. Um, and it's been highly cited, uh, you know, in research papers, probably one of the most cited documents in English. And it wasn't intended to be a citable book. It was intended to be a, an educational book. So it was a it was a compromise. Okay, very good. I have a question here from Chela Palomino War. It says, great stories, great history, greetings from Peru. According to your uh, great experience, what do you think is the biggest challenge that young hydrogeologists will have in the future? And what's your advice <laughs> of questions? Take it. <laughs> Any of you? You first, you first John. Well, I think that young hydrogeologists, almost like anybody in hydrogeologists, are going to have problems explaining the importance of groundwater. And many, if not most, young hydrogeologists are going to work in organizations where there aren't all that many groundwater experts, or if there are, the groundwater people aren't in control. So the complaints that I hear from the younger generation is getting getting respect for groundwater and therefore getting the opportunities to do what their education uh, prepares them to do. And I think I would add to that that I, I would recommend that you spend a little bit of time learning more about the sort of political and legal and economic aspects of, of water resources and, and other groundwater problems. When you get out in the real world, you discover that the technical expertise that you have is just one of the inputs that that, are, that go into all the decisions that you'll be a part of. And it's, uh, I think it would be helpful to learn. I know in, in my background, I didn't really learn anything about any of those kind of things uh, until I was <clears throat> sort of thrown into the deep water as a consultant. Uh, it, would, it would help to get a little background in that direction right earlier in your career. And the Groundwater Project is intended to help on that regard. We have chapters in preparation on groundwater economics, on governments, on governance, on laws. So uh, one of our emphasis points is to uh, write, uh, get experts to write at the interfaces of hydrogeology with all the other important things. Okay, thank you. 
I have a, a surprise for us here. You know, when I mentioned uh, the ladies, the Turkish ladies that, 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 that said that John was the uh, Michael Jackson of groundwater. One of them is here. Seven in Ireland say hi to all of us. Okay, John, would you want to add that? That was great. I loved it. <laughs> well, that was uh, a moment in my life. I'd never thought of being uh, referred to in that uh, context. Uh, in particular, I can't dance. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. That's very good. John, but now that she's here, she, she mentioned that she could translate uh, some material into Turkish. Don't you remember that? Now it's a good time for us to give her work. What do you think? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, this is wonderful. We've got books ready for translation, and uh, it'd be wonderful to get them into Turkish. And uh, uh, Turkish was one of the three languages that the Freeze and Cherry book appeared in, English uh, and Chinese and Turkish. So good tradition there. Okay, I have another question from Todd Rasmussen from, from, from Athens, Greece. Can you speak uh, about the J Lair's contribution to the profession? Well, I think he made a great contribution to the profession. He took the National Groundwater Association from being a very small, relatively unimportant uh, organization to uh, you know an organization that has uh, visibility in in the in the world at large, not just in our own field. And uh, you know, I, I think. I don't know the numbers of the of the membership, but when we when it started, I think it was probably only a few hundred people. Now there's tens of thousands. Uh, so there's no question that Jay's been an important uh, influence in the field. And he's he, as you all, anybody that knows him, he's full of pizzazz, and uh, you know he, he he does things his own way, and it makes it life more interesting. It's true. I agree with Al. Uh, Jay was brilliant in uh, marketing groundwater, and he knew how to explain groundwater to drillers and just about anything else. And he was so brilliant that he could dictate very lucid editorials for the Groundwater Journal, uh, apparently, uh, while he was walking on his treadmill. Yeah. Uh, so Jay was the most unusual character who showed up in the groundwater field when it was needed. I don't know if everybody knows that he was a, 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 a triathlete well into his 60s, maybe even 70s. I don't know if he's still doing it or not. <laughs> yeah, he was an amazing guy. True, true. Guys, I have another question for you here. It's from Amin Tuab in uh, Agadir in Morocco. Could you recommend a good book on fractal rock? Fractal rock, rock hydrogeology. So fractured rock hydrogeology is an area that I've been working on with colleagues at the University of Guelph, my colleague, Dr. Beth Parker. And there aren't any uh, good textbooks that covered fractured rock hydrogeology from a contamination viewpoint. Um, there are, uh, there's a book by Peter Cook in Australia that's freely available on the web. Uh, and that's on fractured rock, uh, groundwater flow, et cetera. But fractured rock is one of the areas that's the least well covered uh, in groundwater science, particularly uh, all things to do with contamination. There is no textbook that I know contamination in a broad educational way. You all want, uh, you want, you want to add something about that? No, I'll leave that to John, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let me see. I have another question from um, Nestor Linares from Venezuela. John, in, in your opinion, who has the best experience uh, in aquifer recharge with positive result, uh, res results? Uh, documentations of this experience? Can you, can you answer that? Well, I'm not an expert on aquifer recharge. I mean, that's now called managed aquifer recharge, but I can say that the groundwater project uh, has that as a priority. Uh, and we have three books on that topic in preparation, including a broad overview book that we would hope would be published in the next six months. Uh, and so we're gathering up experts from around the world to 
to bring that topic, one of the most important topics of all now. Thanks for your question. Paul, no golf questions for you today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I have a, I have a, just one, one uh, uh, thing here from Ken Goldstein. Ken Goldstein from US. He said, it would be quite curious to know what you would have written differently looking back 40 years uh, with all these advances in science. That's an interesting question. Looking back, what would you do differently in your book? considering what happened, if you could anticipate the future. That's, a, that's what I think is his, his point. Well, if we could anticipate the future, things would be much simpler all around uh, in life. Uh, so I, 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 we didn't have the ability to anticipate the future, except as I've made the point on several occasions that John certainly saw the future of the contaminant uh, problems ar arising and the need to have a book that covered that sort of material. Would we do anything completely differently? Uh, maybe we'd put the diagram right side up on the cover. I don't know. <laughs> John. So that, that I, I could comment further. So the book was published in 1979, um, and it said nothing about dense uh, non-aqueous phase liquids, nothing about Dean apples. It didn't even have the word trichloroethylene in it. Uh, and in 1979, I was considered to be an expert on groundwater contamination. And I was, I was, you know, conducting myself as if I was. Uh, and um, so I, I missed, I missed the initial evidence that chlorinated solvents were going to become important. Now, all my colleagues did. Uh, but that, um, that uh, was kind of surprising. So by 1981 or 82, Dean apples were the big thing in the United States with the legislation of RECRA and, and uh, CERCLA, and yet the Friesen Cherry book didn't even mention it. Interesting story about how come we missed it. How come everybody else missed it except one person in Germany, uh, Frederick Schwartz. I think he's trying to say Frederick Schwili. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a bad connection here. Sorry about this. Could you could you come back a little a little bit, John? Because it, it frozen in the, the last three or four sentences. Oh, so I was commenting that the only person in the world that I know of that realized chlorinated solvents were going to be important was Frederick Schwili in Germany, and he'd already published on it in German. Uh, and uh, so he saw what was important uh, and the rest of us didn't. I think that's, I mean, there are all sorts of little things in the book that we didn't cover, maybe because we didn't know about them, but uh, that was the big one that, uh, that uh, we missed. I think you have to realize that when we were writing that, that the, we, we were trying to write a book of broad coverage, what we felt was broad coverage at that time, including a lot of things that had not appeared in groundwater textbooks before on things like land subsidence and soil uh, irrigation and drainage and all this sort of thing. Uh, whether we should have made the book thicker with more material on all these other topics uh, or whether we should have made it thinner with uh, less material on some of those external topics. You know, looking back on it, to be honest, I don't think I would have done it, you know, a whole lot different. Despite John's feelings that we maybe missed the boat a little bit on some of these issues, in all honesty, those issues were not uh, at the forefront at that time. And and John was the one that, that certainly educated me on it. And I, I, I thought I was pretty much up on the field at the time. So I don't think and there's any embarrassment about the fact that there's no Dean apples in there. They, they, they just simply hadn't been thought about yet, or at least, as you, as you said, only very, very by a few people. Good. I have one, one uh, last question, a bit, a bit, a bit tough yeah, one, I'm, I think. Not Please go, go on, John. Please go. You want to say something? It's okay. I wasn't going to say anything. Yeah. No, no, I'm okay. okay. So I have a, a question here from Israel Medina. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, make it shorter for you. He uh, he asked us 
uh, if you know something about the, the, the role of data analysis using machine learning, for example, for groundwater variability, if you, if you have something to say about that or the future of that. That's a tough question. I'm afraid it's not something I'm, I'm aware of, no. You, John? I know nothing about it other than <laughs> to hear the younger generation talking about it being very important. Uh, and and, and uh, so we, for the sake of the groundwater project, then we need to find out more, more about that and make sure that we have people. I've got a bad connection, Everton. It's probably finishing. Yeah, I understand, I understand yeah. that. I understand yeah. that. Okay, guys, uh, our time is up here. And I'd like to thank Al Fries and John Cherry for his participation. It was wonderful to have you here and to tell the story of the book. Many of the, the students who use the book who were interested in knowing that. And your presence here is an illumination for most of us. Thank you very much. Would you like to say a, a, a final word? All you first. Oh, it's been a pleasure to do this, uh, Everton. And uh, uh, we all wish John the best with his team and putting together the, the Groundwater Project. It's a massive and, and exciting possibility. And uh, we, we'll look what happens over the next few years. Thank you, John. Oh, yeah, well, Everton, I, I thank you for doing the Master of Ceremonies job to bring, to bring people to the science. This has never been done before. Usually the people who write the science are just people that we, we can, you know, see their name. So thanks for giving us the opportunity to have ourselves brought to the global readership. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for, for participating. And you that are watching us, please tell your friends, share, share the link of our video. We know that we have a public from all over the, the, the world. And, you know, time is an issue. We try to pick the best timing for everybody, but uh, you know that this is impossible. So if tell everybody that this is, uh, is on YouTube, people can watch later when they want. Share with your friends, make groundwater visible. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on Friday with the next session. Bye, everybody. Thank you.